Hey guys, this video is sponsored by SteelSeries, so make sure to stick around after the end to find out how you can get a discount on your next order. One of the best things about being a kid in the 90s was the escapism that you got from video game arcades. You'd enter these dimly lit dungeons with a pocket full of change and often really never know what you were going to be seen. You see, this is long before the days of the internet, so walking into an arcade with your mates and seeing something like the X-Men game for the first time or Time Crisis must have been like how man felt the first time he discovered fire. What also happened too was that a lot of the games we owned on our home consoles were often just ports of whatever we played at the arcades. And I know for me personally that was definitely the case with games like Street Fighter 2 and Golden Axe. As a lifelong fan of first person shooters, I also blame a lot of those early light gun games from the arcades in helping to build that obsession. One of those was the Virtuacop series developed by Sega AM2. Now, these are the guys who were making some of the first games with actual polygon graphics, with titles like Virtua Fighter, Virtua Racing, Virtua Toilet, and I think everyone can remember playing through Daytona USA at 1.2. Like everything else, a lot of these games got PC ports as well, and what's good about a lot of them, especially Virtuacop 1 and 2, is that they're actually pretty close to the arcade versions. Even though I think when it comes to Virtuacop, the best version of the game was the one that made its way to the PlayStation 2, the Virtuacop Elite Edition. Not only did this version come with both original games, but it also had a whole bunch of customization options, even down to being able to swap through weapons in the poor screen. It also has one of the best title screens of all time. Virtual Cup Elite Edition! The only issue is that it really does fundamentally change the way the game looks. The new models and the new textures aren't really improved versions, they look like something created from scratch. It's kind of the same deal with what happened with Time Crisis 2. It's a whole tomatoes tomato kind of deal because otherwise it still plays exactly the same, but it does make it feel a lot less like the original. Anyway, like Konami's lethal enforcers before it, Virtuacop was an on-rail shooter where you played as either Michael Hardy or James Cools, gunning down waves and waves of nameless criminals. With lethal enforcers though, it was just a 2D background with animated sprites. Virtuacop was fully 3D and you're moving through these much more fleshed out environments, with the camera even zooming in to help pinpoint the locations of enemies. There's also a lot of similarities between these two games. I mean, for starters, they both take place in semi-realistic locations, dealing with criminals who are doing dirty deeds like robbing banks, holding people hostage, and smuggling crates of Mountain Dew. Yeah, sick shit. Every level ends in a boss fight, and the first boss from the first level of both games is the player against some arsehole with an RPG. You can find temporary replacements for your starting weapon in the form of a magnum revolver, automatic pistols, and rifles. Though in Lethal Enforcers, you often lose these as quickly as you find them. <laughs> Plus, they're both about as 1990s as you could possibly get in tone and theme. All you need to do is take a good listen to either game's soundtrack, which are both a thing of beauty, by the way, and it all just becomes clear. <laughs> This also came out before the Time Crisis series, and it seems the focus here was much more on precise shots, compared to the faster, constant barrage of enemies you faced in the Time Crisis games. Virtua Cop even has a thing called the Justice Shot, where instead of killing someone, you could shoot the weapon out of their hand. I'd say that Time Crisis is more like a John Woo film. You've got dudes running all over the place, and you just kind of shoot at them like a madman, mashing down on that trigger before reloading in the blink of an eye as you then keep on firing. Virtua Cop, on the other hand, is more like a Dirty Harry movie. You're more precise, calm, and collected. You take aim a bit more slowly and then deliver that perfect killing shot. Even more than that, though, the gun in Virtua Cop is a revolver, whereas in Time Crisis, it's a semi automatic pistol. Capiche? Now, both Virtua Cop 1 and 2 followed the same basic structure. Each game had three levels called Beginner, Medium, and Expert, and then each level's broken down into multiple scenes. It's not really a difficulty mode selection, though. I mean, it's basically just level 1, 2, and 3. And to finish the whole thing, you're going to have to play through all of them anyway. During the levels, enemies would then pop out to attack you. A circle with a meter appears around them, showing you how long you had until they were going to fire and hit you. So what you had to do was pretty simple. Shoot them before they shoot you. Try and avoid all the brainless civilians who get in your way. 
I mean, yeah, you'd think it wouldn't be an issue to not shoot all these innocent people, but you'd be surprised at how easy it was to lose your concentration, even for that split second and accidentally hit them, which would of course cost you one of your precious health points. I'd argue that people often lost more health points to killing the civilians than they did the enemies. At least I know I did. Help me. To reload the gun, you'd aim it off screen and shoot once to reload. Get hit too many times or kill too many civilians and it's game over, man. Game over. I mean, it was a basic but effective gameplay loop that took all of five seconds to learn. Like any good arcade game, it had the hallmarks of being intuitive and easy to understand, meaning anyone could pick it up and play along with the hallmark of it being the equivalent of a greedy, gold-digging girlfriend in arcade cabinet form. Yeah man, this thing's responsible for the destitution of countless kids back in the day. These things are responsible for getting more people's money in the 1990s than camouflage cargo shorts. Help me. Birch Got One was originally released in arcades in 1994, before it was then ported to the Sega Saturn in 1995, where a grand total of 13 people actually bought it probably the same 13 people who owned a Saturn, before it was then released for the PC in 1997. And as far as I can tell, both the PC and the Saturn version are pretty much identical. I mean, to be honest, I haven't actually played the Saturn version, but I can say that visually they both seem to be neck and neck, with the PC version obviously being that little bit sharper. Even now though in 2021, regardless of how you play it, I gotta say, I still think the gameplay holds up. Right away you'll notice how crisp and responsive it feels when you shoot people. There's a punchy sound effect when someone's hit, and enemies have these dramatic death animations. It's just a really satisfying amount of feedback you get when shooting someone, making your shots feel like they're really doing damage. The only thing that kind of annoys me about the PC port is how you have to press the right mouse button twice to reload, instead of just once. But otherwise, it controls surprisingly well with the mouse, and the wind-up time with enemies before they shoot at you kind of circumvents the fact that you're not using a light gun. If you're playing the Elite Edition on the PS2 with the gun con, well, you can even reload by pushing down on any one of the controller's buttons. Ideally, the one on the bottom of the handle to make reloading even easier and almost instantaneous. Yeah, it's much better than having to aim off the screen every couple of seconds. The first level takes place at the city docks, which is apparently the secret location for an illegal arms market or something. So you start off at the front gate, shooting a bunch of dudes wearing sunglasses. And nothing screams generic bad guys more than black suits and sunglasses, let me tell you. Then you start moving through the shipyard. There's guys jumping out of trucks, there's dudes on top of cranes, and civilians running into the firing line like complete dickheads. Help me. The second scene is more of the same. You get a brief glimpse at the end of Level Boss as he drives past on a truck, and then your first chance to shoot at an explosive barrel, which leaves behind this awesome looking explosion. I mean, yeah, check that shit out. If you shoot this crate, you get an automatic pistol, which introduces one of the game's many useful weapons. The automatic pistol can be fired 15 times before reloading, as opposed to only 6 with the revolver. Doesn't do any more damage though, considering every enemy still dies in a single hit, but these power-ups are still really useful and they have some really cool sound effects. If you're quick enough during the final scene here, you'll also grab the shotgun inside this warehouse. It's only got six shots this time, but it has a much bigger radius, and it proves once again that girth is more important than length, which is something I've been trying to convince my girlfriend for years now. So as far as shotguns go, this thing slaps. But Metal Slug, I think, still retains the crown for the best arcade game shotgun by far. <laughs> Then after a minute or so of doing your bit to reduce prison overcrowding, you're up against the boss for the first level, named Kong. <laughs> and this guy shoots missiles at you while he's dodging left and right, but he's still pretty easy to deal with. Then there's a bit of a fake out at the end where he pretends to surrender before you finally finish him off. Next up is the so-called medium stage, which is an underground weapon storage. And this starts off at a construction site or something, and this time instead of those guys in business suits, now you're dealing with guys wearing tank tops and vests. And of course, they've got sunglasses on. They start throwing a lot more of these close range enemies at you too. The ones who just kind of pop up out of nowhere with an axe or a sharp object at point blank range. Reminds me a lot of those enemies in the Chinatown level in Lethal Enforcers. During the second scene, you can grab an Uzi for the first time. Uzi 9mm. But unlike the automatic pistol and the shotgun, you can't reload this thing. Yeah, so once the bullets are gone, well, so is the weapon. You do get 30 bullets though before it runs out, which is pretty handy. 
you can also get the automatic pistol upgrade again, which makes the next section a whole lot easier, because there is a shitload of enemies in this bit, along with this asshole driving a goddamn truck. Help me. They start to introduce these guys who can throw grenades, along with really stepping up the amount of enemies on screen at once, reminding you yet again how this thing was designed with the goal of taking all of your pocket change. Help me. This is the virtual cop I know and love right here, though, with a car explosion thrown in for good measure. And just look at all of this gorgeous low polygon mayhem. It's amazing. The last part of this level takes place in a really cramped hallway where enemies are all hiding behind crates and barrels. So what do you do? Well, grab that machine gun, Sunny Jim, and clean house. Near the end of this room, you'll also get the Magnum just as the second boss fight begins against this guy named King. <laughs> yeah, we've got King and Kong. I mean, it's a reference so subtle, if you blink, you might miss it. That was sarcasm, by the way. <laughs> He's suitably named at least because King is probably the hardest boss in the game. What he does is jump around and shoot fireballs, but you can only damage him when he's attacking. Otherwise, your bullets just seem to bounce right off his chiseled pectorals. The catch is that you've got to try and shoot him enough to do some damage, but also quickly shoot the fireballs before they hit you, and it really does kind of feel like it was designed with two players in mind. And it is kind of important, I think, to mention just how much of these games seem designed around co-op play. More evident, I think, by how pretty much every piece of marketing material shows all of these characters standing around together. Ha <laughs> ha! Sure enough, you two! So you made it this far, huh? Anyway, after you shoot him for a bit, he buggers off behind these crates, and a bunch of guys that look like something out of the old Rainbow Six games start attacking you, before King finally comes back. Then, after a bit more lead persuasion, he finally goes down. <laughs> Now we're at the final level, the gang's headquarters. Wait, what? Evil Corporation? I mean, the clue's in the name, guys. The enemies at this point are all decked out in military outfits, and you can tell they mean business. It's also when you've got the least amount of time to kill someone before they get a shot off. This is kind of like Nakatomi Plaza from Die Hard, but in reverse. Instead of trying to get out of the building, you're trying to get into it. Starting with the underground garage. Garage? Hey fellas, the garage! This bit's actually pretty awesome. And there's a couple of times we can even shoot these crates and blow up some of those explosive barrels. And it's always kind of nice when bad guys are nice enough to hang out around those conveniently placed explosive barrels. I think out of all the things to take cover behind during a gunfight, something highly volatile that explodes under any kind of gunfire probably ain't the ideal choice. Well, ooh la dee da, Mr. Frenchman. After this, you're in the lobby with more civilians running around into the line of fire yet again. The truck bursts through the front window at one point, and then all these guys start jumping out of it before you head up to the escalator and clear out a few more rooms. This bit's actually pretty funny too. There's like a dozen enemies all hiding behind this one desk, popping up one after the other like goddamn whack-a-moles. The next room, I think, is the hardest in the entire game, and I think it was designed by someone at Sega AM2 who was just really having a crappy day and felt like taking that out on the player. You're in an office now, which is a classic backdrop for a shootout, but there's just so many bad guys at this point that it's overwhelming. It's like they're coming out of the goddamn walls. And the problem is that you can't shoot through any of these computers to hit them. But let me tell you, those old CRT monitors, well, they were some pretty heavy duty shit. They used to launch those things out of trebuchets to destroy fortified walls back in the 13th century. If you've made it this far in the arcade version at this point without dying, well, then you should really give yourself a pat on the back. And you're either incredibly gifted, you have an eidetic memory and can remember the placement of every single enemy, or you were just a spoiled asshole with a big allowance. Either way, we're in the end game, and after shooting through a bunch of guys in gas masks and hazard suits, we come up to the final boss, who's literally just Kingpin. I mean, how did they not get sued for this? This big bald asshole hops into a giant tank that does seem pretty powerful at first, but has a pretty huge design fault in the way that it leaves his head completely exposed. Now look, I'm no expert on engineering, but that does seem like a pretty glaring oversight. It'd be like a hockey goalie being covered in padding from head to toe, but then having his entire groin completely uncovered. It's like someone said to him, we're gonna cover you in bulletproof armor and give you all these high powered weapons, but about your head, well, we're just gonna leave that one wide open. As a result, he's pretty easy to take out and he goes down really quickly. And that's it, we finished the game. You can watch all these guys that we didn't get round to shooting being arrested. Marvel at that ray tracing reflection on the cop car and enjoy this sweet soothing end music. And then check out that end title screen which just screams 90 Sega.
It wasn't until 1995 that there was a sequel when Virtuacop 2 got released, and then that didn't see a console port until the Saturn in 1996 and the PC in 1997. And of course, it also got included in the highly superior Elite Edition. I've got to say too that as a sequel, this is everything you'd want it to be. It doesn't really change up the formula too much, I mean it's still broken down into three levels, each with three different scenes and a boss fight, but you'll really soon see just how much better it is than the first game. The first level starts off in the midst of a citywide crime spree, where you take time out of your busy schedule of shooting people on the street, but shooting people inside a building. <laughs> One thing I noticed too is that on the PC port, this guy here is using what looks like an M16, but in the arcade version, he's holding like a goddamn anti-aircraft gun or something. As you can probably see, there's already way more enemies to deal with, and I'd argue that you shoot more people in this first scene here than you do in the entire first level of the first game. The shooting and the reloading also feel so much better in the PC port this time, simply because you only need to press the right mouse button once now to reload instead of twice. It's a small change, but a good one. <laughs> Once you've cleared out that private army that was inside the jewelry store, it's time for a good old fashioned car chase, and holy shit, this next bit is awesome. There's bad guys shooting at you out of car windows, you're having all these close calls with passing vehicles and pedestrians, and they've even somehow taken hostages too. What's even cooler too is how if you shoot the tires of the cars, it causes them to flip over and explode. The chase comes to an end when the van that you're after just suddenly seems to self-combust. Come again. But it doesn't stop there, and now we're shooting guys on what looks like the streets of downtown LA. It also seems that we've stopped next to some kind of bad guy motel or something, because every single room in this building has an enemy shooting at you from a window. <laughs> Up next is one of the main new features in Virtuacop 2, where the game gives you the option of where to go next. At this point, we can either choose to go downtown or go on a lovely seaside drive. Either way, all paths lead to more car chase. Like all good things do, it all eventually comes to an end. At some kind of abandoned warehouse or something, and after killing another couple dozen bad guys, you'll finally take on the first boss. <laughs> where are you looking? I'm over here, cop. This guy is kind of like Kong, the boss from the first level of the first game, only this time, aside from launching rockets, he also throws barrels at you like he's actually Donkey Kong. When his health is low enough, he even picks up a goddamn van, but otherwise he goes down quicker than leftover spaghetti bolognese. For the second level, we're down at the city docks, trying to save the mayor, who's been held hostage on a big cruise ship. They must really want this mayor too, because there's a literal army of bad guys you have to gun down to save him. From this point on, the game is just pretty much throwing a constant barrage of enemies at you, and it really doesn't let up. Like before, you'll commit a small act of bad guy genocide here, just mowing down so many enemies you almost kind of lose track of it. Let me just say, if any of these bad guys have families, well, their kids are going to probably end up becoming orphans or put on welfare. <laughs> The boss fight for this level is kind of interesting, because instead of it being one enemy, it's five enemies all on jetpacks, who also happen to shoot rockets, and again, it's another boss fight that I can't help but feel like it's been designed around co-op play, simply because trying to shoot that onslaught of rockets and the enemies at the same time is a bit of a mean feat. It's kind of like trying to scramble legs while giving someone a foot job. I never know what that means. No sign of the mayor once you finally beat them though, but apparently we saved the day, so goody gumdrops. Finally, we're up to the so-called expert stage, and yeah, they really weren't bullshitting. This level is pretty damn tough, and right from the get-go, we've got dudes in balaclavas popping out of every nook and cranny. Early on in the level, you get onto the subway, which then takes off, and you're having to clear out the carriage. At one point, you hop out of the carriage and even get on top of the train shooting some guy out of a nearby chopper. And it is pretty awesome for the time, seeing this scrolling 3D background go past as you're mowing down all of these bad guys. I've always kind of wondered if Time Crisis 2 was influenced by this, as that game also had a pretty awesome train level. Obviously, with the improved technology at the time, their level blows this one in Virtual Cop 2 out of the water. But I don't think it's a stretch to think that they were influenced by Virtual Cop 2, at least maybe in a small way. <laughs> Up next, you're given the option again of two paths, either the Arcade Line or Saturn Way. Yeah, Arcade and Saturn, get it? Both routes involve lots of shooting and killing people, so it's a win-win. After then moving through what looks like a Zeppelin hangar, because I guess those were still a thing in the 1990s, it's on to the final boss. But unlike Virtual Cop 1, this one's actually really fucking hard. If only for the fact that I have no idea how you're supposed to stop the tankies in from hitting you with those metal arms. 
And if you want to see, yet again, another example of how much the Elite Edition differs to the original, well, look no further. Eventually, after a few dozen bullets and maybe a couple of credits, the tank explodes. And the guy inside makes one last desperate attempt to kill you by running towards you with an axe. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Then if you've finished all three levels at this point, you get the final boss fight, which is kind of easy. It seems my plan's been ruined, but I can at least finish you. What you're supposed to do is kill him before the Zeppelin in the background crashes. I mean, I guess. To be honest, I don't know because I've never failed it. But finally, you've finished Virtual Cop 2. Oh! And just like the first game, you get this cool montage of all of these bad guys getting arrested, along with Duke Nukem. And I just don't think I can fully emphasize how comfy this whole ending is. It's something about the music, the way the characters look, the animations, and that skybox. It just encapsulates everything awesome about 90s gaming. It's just good old-fashioned killing with a wholesome ending. Those were different times indeed. There was also eventually a Virtua Cop 3 made in 2003, even bringing the same characters back. But this one never got ported to home consoles. You can play through it with an Xbox emulator in theory, but I've never been able to get this thing working properly. And I gotta say that I do think playing rail shooters with a controller is objectively the worst way to play them. It's like trying to do calligraphy with a dog turd. So until the unlikely time comes when Sega goes back and repackages or remasters all of these games, well, this is really the only way to play it. Not that it seems like you're missing out on much though, considering Time Crisis 3 came out the same year. And I mean, looking at those two side by side, well, it's pretty easy to pick what looks the most exciting. And I guess that's kind of really the main thing here, because as good as these games were, I do think the Virtuacop series ultimately got outshined by Time Crisis. Having said that though, I think those games still owe their existence to Virtuacop. It was one of, if not the first rail shooter to ever include actual polygons, as well as having really impressive death animations depending on which body part you shot. It's a groundbreaking title from a period where the gaming industry was just constantly evolving and trying new things. I've always felt that Lethal Enforcers was the one that really started the whole shooting bad guys rail shooter trend. At least, it's always the one I think of, and it's the first one I can remember playing as a kid. And Virtua Cop has always kind of felt like a natural progression of that formula, adapting the whole thing into a fully 3D setting. And consider too that those games were two years apart. I mean, look at them side by side, and it looks like a completely different generation. Go back and look at a two-year-old game now and try to find the difference in something you're playing in the current year. I think you'd have an easier time finding cellulite on a lingerie model's ass cheeks. These are defining entries for rail shooters, but also just quintessential arcade games. These first two Virtual Cop games are just one of those staples that you'd always see whenever you walked into an arcade back then, along with Metal Slug, that X-Men game, and something like Super Street Fighter 2. And as much as I attribute Alicia Silverstone and Clueless to helping kickstart me into puberty, I also attribute the Virtuacop series and those other action games that followed it to help getting me hooked on first-person shooters. It also taught me not to shoot people decked out in white jumpsuits, and that you can also find assault rifles inside trash cans, which are both important life lessons. Right, so if you're still watching, well, thanks for sticking around. And let me give a final shout out to my sponsor, SteelSeries. SteelSeries makes some of the best gaming peripherals from headsets, keyboards, mice, and gaming pads, all synced together with a handy program that lets you modify the hell out of them. I'm a bit of a stickler for high quality mouses and keyboards, and whether you're playing a game that's eight months old or eight years old, it makes a huge difference in how well something handles. I would never recommend something that I don't use myself, and I'm pretty stoked to be able to offer a discount to people looking at buying some new gear. So just make sure to use that Chad promo code GMAN at checkout to get 12% off your next order. And as always, thanks for watching.